Uh oh, here we go. We're going live. I hope. Let's see. Yeah, there's that bumper music. Yeah. Hey, Pond Boss Magazine, everybody. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do. Here we go. Here we go, everybody. Bob Lutz, the Pond Boss, coming at you live from uh, Pond Boss World Headquarters over here in North Texas, Gordonville, Tim Stewart, Ron Ardwan. Looks like Zach's up there. Got to talk to Zach earlier. So uh, good to see you guys. Glad you're checking in. Hey, you know the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like, share this to your timeline, and you are eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat. Whoa, there goes the mug. Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. It knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it does it, but it, it knows it, that, how to do it. Look at there's Jacob West. He could have said that. John Funk. Gene Saunders from North Carolina. Good to see you guys. Palm Boss Magazine, $35 a year. Hey, we had a really nice article in this issue of uh, In Fisherman Magazine. If you guys haven't caught up with that, it talks about some of our philosophies about growing big bluegills. So, uh, if you guys haven't picked up in Fisherman, pick that up, check it out, see what it, see what's going on. Actually, it's kind of helped us create some new subscribers. We've been getting a, a little influx from that, so we appreciate in Fisherman. So now I'm gonna see if I can find this video so I can see everybody's comments. They go way too fast. I see Trey Carpenter checking in. Hey Trey, we ought to have a conversation. Um, John Funk. Let's see. Holy cow, I'm getting behind. Zach, John Funk, Gene Saunders, said hello. Mike Cottrell. There's Mike. Summer weather in May, says John Funk in the 90s. Holy cow, already up in Michigan. It's that warm. You just got snow the other day. Andy Eddings, Trey Carpenter, Ron Ardwan, and three other people, but I can't see who it is. So there's Travis Paul Smith. So you know what? I've had the chance to talk to several of you guys in the last few days. Got to talk to... Um, Kevin Briggs today, he bought a big seine and was planning on seining a pond. He sent me a note. I don't know how well it how well it went. Danny Mack checking in. Bear Brundritz checking in. Danny Mack's already got a question posted up there. There's Fred Bingaman. Good to see him. And Jacob's got his happy, happy, happy. Ms. Weekly Fish Fix. Zach says it's 90 degrees in New York on Monday. Woo, that's kind of hot. It's like 65 here this morning in North Texas. There's Harrison Davis checking in from Norcross, Georgia. Let's see what Danny Mac says. Hello, Bob, you're looking good. Well, thank you very much. I'm feeling pretty good. I had a shower. <laughs> Wondering if other folk have experienced toe biter beetles killing their minnows. Well, we'll just ask, any of you have any toe biter beetles eating your fathead minnows? Or at least killing them? I don't know. I think you need to have a talk with your minnows. They need to speed up. <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. Today's topic, I thought I'd talk about how to make small waters better fishing ponds. There's David Schneiderman, our easy dock go-to guy. We got some good folks checking in. We've already got, what, 38 watching? It's 37. Very good, very good, very good. So let's talk about how to take small waters and make them better fishing ponds. I had a, a conversation with a guy the other day and he said, you know, I've got a three acre pond and fishing has been great. And then all of a sudden it, it was great last fall, but going into this spring, it's just the fish aren't biting. So I said, well, have you been feeding the fish? And he says, well, yeah, I've tried to, but there's not many fish coming to the feed. Well, that kind of made me start thinking that he's had something happen over the winter that he doesn't know. So we got to talking and asked him, are there any creeks nearby or any other major reservoirs or ponds or anything like that? And I would just about bet that he had some otters hit him over the winter. Uh, I asked him about um, water turkeys, cormorants, things like that. He didn't notice any, but he doesn't live there. So he's thinking that it is a fishing problem or I'm wondering if it's a fisheries problem. So what I told him to do was to go fish it intently with 
a variety of baits, a variety of sizes of line, different techniques to go buy a trap from the, uh, a bait store, a minnow trap, see if you can catch any small fish, like baby bluegills, anything like that, and then to go around the edge of the pond and look closely and see if you can find any scat with scales in it. Now, even if an otter ate a fish three months ago, four months ago, you are very likely to find scat somewhere with scales in it. Just ask him to see if you can find any pieces of fish or like partially eaten fish. So he's going to go do that and then come back and talk to me. Let's see here. Uh, Donald McDonald says, on fish food for ponds, is it better to have high protein or have high fat content? Much better to have high protein. And that protein, depending on the type of fish that you're wanting to feed, I'm going to presume you're going to feed carnivores. You're going to be feeding fish like bass, uh, you know, largemouth bass that are on fish food, hybrid stripers, bluegills, fish like that. They need a fish meal-based fish food. Now, there are other proteins that are digestible, but they're not as palatable. So when you look at the tag on the fish food, be sure it says fish meal in it, and it needs to be number one on the on the list of, of, of ingredients. So uh, let's see here. The high fat content, that really doesn't help them. The, I'll tell you why there's fat in fish food. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to renege a little bit on my statement. If you're feeding trout or salmonids, it's important to have fat. If you're feeding warm water game fish, they don't need as much. They need a higher protein. Now, both, both those genres of fish need high protein, but there's going to be more fat in salmonid feed than there is feed for, for warm water fish. That's why I like Purina's Aquamax sport fish products. Because they're designed for our warm water fish, bluegills, feed trained bass, hybrid striped bass, even the minnows. Channel catfish do great on it. Channel catfish don't have to have fish meal based fish foods because they're more omnivorous. They can actually digest grain based fish foods. So it depends on what you're feeding. But I would, to answer your question, high protein is better than high fat. I see Leanne checking in, Michael Gray's checking in. Let's see, Ron Ardoin says, should we see fingerling bass from this spring spawn? Absolutely, you should. Now, you, uh, you're you in South Louisiana, so your fingerling bass ought to be about four to five inches long now. I've electrofished several ponds in the last three or four weeks, and it was striking to me that I found two different size classes of this year's Young of the Year bass in Texas. Uh, I electrofished a pond about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, where are we, May? Yeah, this was about the second week of April, and fish were paired up. So when we were shocking, what that means to me is we would shock a male and a female right there together, and we shocked up about six pairs of fish. That means they were in the midst of spawning when we shocked them up. However, when you looked at them, you could tell those females had already spawned once. And as we were electrofishing that pond or that lake, which is probably a 14 acre lake, the first one we did, we shocked up some four to five inch bass that had to have been hatched in the last uh, full moon time, which was about five, four or five weeks earlier than that. So there were some bass that were one month old and there were bass on the beds and we saw several clouds of fry that we saw as we went around the lake. As I saw those fry, I backed the electric fishing boat away so we wouldn't shock them, so it wouldn't hurt them. So there's Michael Gray checking in. Michael, we, uh, we've we been working on, hey, you know what, guys, I gotta tell you this, this, seeing Michael here. Michael's one of our regular contributors. He's got his regular, he's got a regular column now that we're gonna call the Earth Surgeon. I love that, but anyway, there's, this is the last time you're going to see palm boss look like this. Now, we've, we've had this look for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, with the next issue, we're starting our 29th year of publication. And the next issue is our launch for a brand new layout. Now, the content is still great. Photography's great. We're going to be able to exhibit our photography better. And the magazine is going to flow better. It's kind of a brand new look. We're going to change up the way we do the cover. We're going to change up the way the magazine flows and our regular columns, regular departments. We've, 
We've never categorized those. We just had those scattered throughout the magazine. Well, our layout guru, Rob Hudgens with 5050 Design, if anybody's looking to have some design work done, this guy's the best in the business. But anyway, it's gonna have a totally different look, which I'm excited about. We've been planning on it for almost a year. So if you haven't subscribed to the magazine yet, please do that. Palm Boss, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. And it lasts a whole year. Let's see here, let me see here. Ron says, uh, well, yep, I answered that one. Travis Paul Smith, I tapped out like a UFC fighter. Two Texas hunter feeders coming tomorrow. Atta boy. <laughs> good for you, now feed him a good fish food. Roger B. Peterson, Jr. Hi, Bob, at the end of last week's show, you quickly stated not to use hydrated lime because it would kill the fish. Is your reasoning based on hydrated lime changing the pH too rapidly? Absolutely, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm going to use that question in um, Ask the Boss, in the, in the column Ask the Boss coming up in this next issue. But let me explain that really fast because I did bust through that. There's a, a number of different kinds of limes. So when somebody says you need to lime your pond, hey, Steve Lewis, good to see you, our buddy from uh, uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, fisheries biologist. So anyway, the, there's, there's hydrated lime, there's quick lime, Hydrated lime means calcium hydroxide. Quick lime, I don't know what the chemistry is of that, but that's typically a liquid lime that is uh, calcium hydroxide as well. There's ag lime, which is calcium carbonate. So what you're trying to do when you lime the pond is your the pH is just an indicator of the acidity or the basicity of your water. That's all it is, it's a measurement. It's like saying, well, I have 10 inches. Well, my pH is seven, or my pH is 6.0, but it doesn't tell you that I have 10 inches of visibility, you know, like that measurement. It's telling you that your pH is either leaning, you know, your water's either leaning toward the acidic side or the basic side. So when you, what you're really after, if the pond needs to be limed, is you need to increase the alkalinity. The alkalinity is calcium carbonate. So if you put if you put um, quick lime or hydrated lime in a pond, it's gonna shoot the pH up, which is gonna change the way the fish metabolizes. It's gonna change the equilibrium of their, of their cells physiologically, and a rapid pH change can kill your fish. So you don't wanna do that. What you want to do is you want to increase the alkalinity, which increases the pond's ability to produce a natural food chain. If you don't have calcium carbonate, think about what your bones are made of. They're made of calcium carbonate. You know, what is your, uh, what's a skeleton of, of a fish made of? Calcium carbonate. So increasing the alkalinity of the water helps create the basis of the food chain, which helps fish food, uh, fish, the pond grow more food for fish and insects to eat. For example, a crawfish's shell is made of calcium carbonate. That's its skeleton. It doesn't have a skeleton, it's shell. But if it doesn't have alkalinity in the water, you're not going to grow crawfish. You know, so you don't want to change the pH as much as you want to change the alkalinity, which affects the pH. I think that's the best way to answer that. So let's see here, there's Daniel Joseph Thompson. Oh, by the way, we have a winner. Leanne did a drawing tonight, and there's here he is right here, Dan Reasoner. Hey, Dan Reasoner, North Texas. You are the winner. You've got a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug that knows how to do what, guys? Yep, very good. How to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Coming your way. So let's see here. Let me look up here, see what all we got going on. Donald McDonald, brim bass, and a few catfish. I'm using 30% protein and 4% fat. Um, I tell you what you do. Look at the tag and see what's listed. See what's listed first. Let me go back through here. Yep, look at, read, I tell you what do. Read your... Donald, read the tag and see what's listed top on the ingredients. Because it's gonna tell you 30% protein, 4% fat. You need to be feeding probably more like 38% protein or even higher. Like Danny Mac's feeding 48% with fish meal in it. So, and you know what, Donald, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, 
If you're feeding brim and feed train largemouth bass and a few catfish, the catfish will do fine on that fish food, but the brim and the bass will not. If those bass are feed trained, it's gonna be if you if you feed them this fish food is like you and I eating donuts. We're gonna gain a lot of weight, but they think it's gonna all end up around our bellies, you know, and it's not gonna be anything that turns to flesh. So that's how you decide which which fish food to use. So if you want them to gain some real weight, uh, Donald says, hard to find here. No, it's really not hard to find in Mississippi. Go find a Purina dealer and tell them you're looking for Aquamax sport fish foods. Every Purina dealer can order that. And they usually order on Tuesdays and get things the following Wednesday. So check in, look up Purina Aquamax sport fish foods. That's what you want. And depending on the size of fish you're feeding, that's gonna determine which food in that product line you want. I, what I'm gonna recommend to everybody right now is MVP. You want multi-variable particle, <laughs> Aquamax Sportfish MVP. That's what you're looking for. Yep, and you can find it in Mississippi, but you need to let the Purina guys do the looking because it's actually some of it's produced in Mississippi. Trey Carpenter, our good friend from Burnett, Texas, when we're cleaning fish, would it do any good to grind up the carcasses and put in the pond? Protein, or would that just be nasty? Um, I'm not a proponent of that because I don't think fish are going to eat it. I think the turtles will eat it. Now, if you cut it up into chunks, catfish might eat it. But if you didn't grind it up, if you ground it up, dried it out, mixed it with something else, it might be a good fish food. It'd probably be a better bait than it would be fish food. Uh, Travis Paul Smith, where in Mississippi? Any purine? Oh, 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 you guys are trying to have a conversation. My bad. Looks like you want to go fishing at his place. Let's see here. Yep, if you'll ask a Purina dealer, they're going to get it for you. You guys are having a side conversation. I like it. Uh, Trey, there are several reasons that I have not ever promoted putting the carcasses back into a pond. One is it attracts turtles, and two... Most time when people fillet a fish, they just throw the whole carcass in the water. And then if by chance somebody's swimming there someday, they can, even two years down the road, you can stick a bone through your foot or other parts of your body. So I don't, I just don't think that's healthy. Plus if the fish don't eat it, then that's just more organic matter that the pond's got to process, digest, compost, and get rid of on its own. There's Kevin Briggs checking in. Let's see here. Steve, good deal. Kevin, gotcha. Travis Paul Smith been feeding MVP for three months. That's a really good fish food. There's Brian Bronner. Hi, Brian. Good to see you, buddy. Micah Jefferson, what's your thought on Southern Speckle Belly Sunfish? Oh, I love questions like that. Southern Speckle Belly Sunfish. By any other name is what? I have no idea, but I'm going to guess. You know, I, I, I don't know what that is. I don't like getting stumped but I have no idea what a southern speckle belly sunfish is unless it's a red ear sunfish. If it's a red ear sunfish, I love it. Uh, they also call those shell crackers, but not too many people that know that they're called shell crackers call them speckle bellies. So you kind of stumped me there. I don't know. I do not know. I don't know what my thoughts are. Give me another name on southern speckle belly sunfish. Is it a green sunfish? Is it a warm mouth? Is it a goggle eye? Is it got another name? Somebody look that up, Southern Speckle Belly Sunfish, and type it in there and let me talk about that because I honestly you don't have any idea. Trevor Cardillo, you know, Brian Bronner, I just kind of blew by Brian. I've known Brian probably for close to 40 years. Brian has been in the fishery supply business off and on his entire life in different aspects of it. So it's good to see Brian. We're talking about pond management stuff there, Brian. Trevor Cardillo, I have a client with a small quarter acre pond that wants to grow healthier bass. Saining and cast nets turn up a lot of large bluegill and shell crackers, only a few small skinny bass. Suggestions, remove bigger bluegill and add larger bass. Okay, I'm going to tell you this, Trevor, that it's not unusual for a quarter acre pond to become bluegill heavy. And that being the case, the problem becomes that bluegill are going to overeat the food chain, including some of their own. And shell crackers will do the same thing, red ear sunfish. Red ear sunfish are shell crackers. So they can be the ones that disrupt reproduction. As a matter of fact, I've, I've stood and watched largemouth bass trying to spawn 
and, and have so many bluegill warding them so heavily that they just vacate. And then they, the eggs get eaten. So reproduction can be inhibited in a bluegill crowded pond. So now the question you're asking is, should you remove some bigger bluegill and add larger bass? I'm not, you know, I'm, go I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to assume that with that circumstance, that it is sunfish crowded. If that's the case, thin out the sunfish. But I would also feed the sunfish. If they're not being fed, feed them MVP and start that as soon as you can. That's a smart way to go there. Because if you feed the bluegill, you're going to decrease their competitiveness, increase their fecundity, which means they're going to have more eggs, which can increase their reproductive capabilities. At the same time you're feeding them, plan to call some. Don't call the biggest ones. Leave the biggest ones in there. In a quarter acre pond, I'm going to give you some numbers. For a pond that's one fourth of an acre, if you've got 50 of the biggest sunfish left, they can populate that pond with small bluegills. So I don't know how many numbers there are, but preserve 50 of the biggest ones and then harvest as many of the smaller ones that you want. If they're all just slightly smaller than that, that's the ones you want to take. Let's see, uh, and stock some larger bass. I don't know that I would add larger bass until you get the bluegill numbers down just a little bit. Let me tell you what that means. On a quarter acre pond, you don't need to add more than about 10 largemouth bass that are not feed trained to turn that thing around. Larger meaning 16 inches. It, 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 actually, I, I would, if I were going to be doing it, I would. I think what I would do is I would add 10 bass that are at least 17 and a half inches or bigger, because that's going to you're pretty well going to make sure that's female bass. And I don't think I'd be worried about culling any of the bass that are there. That's that's the way I would answer that. Harrison Davis, as long as I get my nuggets, you can color the whole thing pink if you want. Well, I guess I missed something. <laughs> Oops. All right. Um, Travis Smith, when it gets hot, I can still feed morning and afternoon with no problems. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me back up here. I'm missing something here. I don't know what it is. Steve Lewis, thanks for the gifts. Heck yeah, you got your Pond Boss hat, I hope. Uh, actually, I don't know if they've been mailed or not. I know, I know it's queued up to be mailed. Let's see here. I'm backing up so I can see what, so make sure I haven't missed something. Let's see, somebody here asked, Kevin Briggs says, what is too high of a pH? I tell you the range of pH really needs to be slightly above five to be adequate. You know, five, two, five, three, up to about 8.5. Any higher than 8.5, that starts to cause trouble for fish's physi physiology. They're, uh, they, they don't digest as well. Their cellular structure starts to be compromised. Um, so, you know, pH up around nine, that's that's fatal. pH down in the low fours, that's fatal. But pH about 5.3 up to about 8.3, 8.4, something like that is pretty darn good. Let's see here. Harrison, I wish I knew what your comment was about, but I don't get it. I would say something. As long as I get my nuggets, you can color the whole thing. Ah, okay, got it. Uh, and Travis Smith talking about when it gets hot, I can still... Oh, 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 you're asking the question. When it gets hot, can I still feed morning and afternoon with no problems? Depends on what hot means. Here's here's the way I'm going to go there. If your, once your water temperature, if your water temperature gets above about 83 degrees, 83 is the magic number for largemouth bass, not quite so much for bluegills, but everything slows down at 83 degrees and above. So if your water temperature is somewhere below 83 degrees and the fish are eating the fish food twice a day, feed twice a day. But once the temperature gets up into the low 80s and you can visibly see the fish slow down, cut it back to one time a day. And I would do that mid-morning when the water is the coolest. I see Dick Tabbert. Good to see you, Dick. Willie Howe, my neighbor's checking in. Let's see here. Um... Josie, I see Josie on here. Good to see Josie and Wayne. 
Mitchell Jordan, Don, I'm not sure what Mississippi you are, but I get my pure fish food at the Madison Co-op, and there we go, we got people talking. Swanton, Ohio, from Dick Tabbert. Red Ear, Harrison Davis, okay. Clark Cole, Danny Mack, Red Ear Cross with a bluegill. Is that a speckle belly? If that's a, okay, Malone and Sons, Hybrid Red Ear is a southern speckle. Oh, okay, so that's a trade name. No wonder I don't know about it. Okay, all right, all right, all right. You know what? I can remember talking to Bobby about that now. I've, I've forgotten about that. Um, the a cross between a red ear and a bluegill, uh, I don't really have an opinion about that yet because I've never used them. You know, I think part of the mission of having a hybrid is so you can get the best of both species. You know, maybe a bluegill that'll eat sunfish and a red ear that will eat uh, I mean, um, a bluegill will eat snails. So, you know, bluegills don't eat snails typically. Red ear do. So if you have a cross between those two, I could see a fish that would eat heavily on snails but also eat fish food. You know, and of course, part of the reason to have a hybrid is so you can have a fish that gets bigger than both parents. You know, so as long as that fish eats fish food, I'd, I'd probably be okay with it. You know what? I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that because I've not dealt with those fish and I've not bought any. I talked to Bobby at Malone's Bobby Glenn probably four or five years ago about the work he was doing to cross those fish. But I don't know much about it. Jacob West, do most species of fish have the instinct to swim upstream? We had two to three hundred fathead minnows trapped in a small pool where water was draining in during a rain. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, most fish's nature is to swim upstream. A handful of species will also go downstream. Now, those are typically carp related fish like koi um um white amur grass carp they'll go down matter of fact grass carp prefer to go downstream than upstream that's why some states require a barrier downstream so they can't migrate from your lake to somebody else's yep so uh kelly nathan lewicky my texas fish feeder is set for one time a day at one second and my fish still don't eat it at all. I was using Sportsman's Choice and ordered MVP last weekend. Do you know the palatability of cheap feed or just slow? Do you think it was the palatability of cheap feed or just slow to feed train bluegill? One second doesn't throw out much more than a thimble full. So that doesn't get the odor of the fish food out. And Sportsman's Choice, it depends on which fish food. If it's the grain-based one of Sportsman's Choice, then there's not much palatability at that fish food at all. But only throwing out enough for one second is not throwing out very much. That's that's probably less than what would fit in the palm of your hand. So I would bump up the feeding time to about five seconds and then see what happens. Uh, see if the fish start coming to it then. It might take them a couple of weeks to find it. But when you switch to a more palatable fish food, which is MVP, and increase the time, the amount of fish food that you're presenting, you're going to get a better response. So see what that is. Okay, Danny Mac says, a farmer in Arkansas. Yep, I think we kind of got that. Okay, the speckle belly. Yep, I don't know. That's That's got to be, it's a colloquial or a trade name, kind of like F1 tiger bass. Okay, I see Micah chiming in there. Um, let's see here. It's a, okay, so Ron Arduin thinks it's a cross between a red ear and a long ear. I don't know. I'd have to, I just, you know what, I'll do a little bit more homework on that. Chris and Carrie Lush, good to see you guys. Michael Eriggs, back up there again from uh, Iowa. Zach Bollinger, can we talk about the different soils which are best for ponds and which are best for farms? <laughs> okay, you bet. Let's talk about that. Um, you know what, I think I'm going to go this direction. When, when, when I'm getting ready to oversee... The construction of a pond. I don't ever, I don't ever take the responsibility of the earth mover. What I do is I help design the interior of the lake, and work with the landowner, and then help connect him up with the right earth mover, like a Mike Otto, for example. And what we do is job number one is to build a dam that has it that does its job. Its job is to impound water properly without with minimal seepage and then release excess water in an orderly fashion. So that's the job of a dam. So in order to do that, we gotta have clay. So you gotta have good clay to build a good dam to minimize seepage loss. 
And then the earth movers got to know how to use that clay. And it's not unusual, although it's, 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 not, um, it's not an everyday occurrence that a pond needs to be lined with clay. So when I start doing the habitat part, I'm looking to, to not have topsoil throughout the majority of the pond bottom. Now, as I get ready to design things like spawning beds and specific areas where I really want aquatic plants to grow, we'll use topsoil in those areas. So in other words, we might go down four feet and build a ledge 10 feet or 12 feet wide and put about five or six inches of topsoil on top of that ledge adjacent to a shade cloth covered with, with gravel for a spawning bed. So we'll have a spawning bed and then adjacent to that, we'll design some, some beds where aquatic plants can grow. They need topsoil for that. So I minimize the placement of topsoil in areas where we don't want plants to grow and we'll use it in areas that we do. And in a farm situation, you want topsoil with organic matter to, to be able to grow plants. So I'm picky about where we use topsoil in a pond basin. There's Andy Myers. Let's see here. Calvin Goforth, I re-up my subscription. I saw that. I saw that. And the aquatic vegetation index cards, I saw that. Your response says one to two weeks for delivery with all the COVID bit. Do you find the shipping to be longer enough? It has not been longer because Leanne's been getting those orders out and I haven't heard anybody saying that they haven't been receiving their things. So I do know this, the office was closed Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And I do remember seeing your email, I think it was last week. So if your order hasn't gone out, it will be going out pretty soon. Then it's all on the shoulders of the post office. There's Mark Dauber. Hi, Mark. Good to see you, buddy. Let's see here. Jay Spire checking in from Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's see. Danny Mac says he's seen Speckle Belly about eight times a day. Well, I haven't seen it at all <laughs> until tonight. Now I've seen it about 30. Let's see here. Travis says, I'll keep an eye on the water temperature. 12-acre pond, 18 feet. Yeah, that's what I would do. There's Jerry Olert. Good to see him. Clark Cole did the deal. You guys know how to do that, right? Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like. Share this to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss mug. Do a little commercial. I want to tell you, the Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks for a year. It's well worth it. Brand new layout, brand new look of the magazine coming out with the July, August issues. As a matter of fact, I just finished editing and writing and getting the photography and all that ready to go. It's at layout, and I can't wait to see the first galley proof, which will be coming up pretty quick. So I'm pretty excited about that. 35 bucks. If you haven't joined up, join up. Share it with your friends. Buy a gift subscription for somebody that's holed up, still, uh, still quarantined away from the corona. So, um, and I also want to say thanks to Texas Hunter for being a sponsor of this show and Purina Mills uh, with their line of Aquamax Pond products. Appreciate you guys helping, helping uh, sponsor this show. So let's see here. Danny Mack. Okay, he's, there's Matt Hines. Mark Dobber, we're feeding our chickens some dried mealworms. What about throwing, oh my gosh, fish love dried mealworms. They love them. Bluegills are going to do that. Let's see here. Steve Lewis says, in my experience, anytime you deal with hybrids, you get very limited spawn. They're mainly males. That's my opinion. No, that's not an opinion. That's a fact. As a matter of fact, it, I would expect with these speckle belly fish that everybody's talking about all of a sudden, the reproduction will be minimal. The majority of those will be males, and they're probably designed to grow big. And if they'll eat snails and fish food, then you got a shot at growing some really big sunfish. But the only purpose I could think for those would be like you'd be using any other kind of hybrid sunfish, which is in a, in a pond where you want limited reproduction, maximum growth rates, and you're not trying to feed largemouth bass. So I could see them probably working with a catfish pond, you know, or a pond where you just want sunfish. That could be a good place to use those. Let's see here. Donald says, I use Sportsman's Choice and have a one and done directional feeder. Great feeder. One second, twice a day. And it's 50 pounds every, okay, 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 all right. Now, if, if you're feeding 50 pounds every two weeks, that's a good number on a pond that size. That's a real good number. Okay, Ken Dowd says, when turning on the aeration system for the first time, can it cause an algae bloom? I just started mine for the year, and now my pond is pea green soup. It sure could be. And uh, now, on, on starting up an aeration system, and 
depending on the time of the year, you need to run it starting about 15 minutes the first day, 30 minutes the next, an hour the next, two hours the next, and you double that every day until you get to 24-7. Now what happens if there's any nutrients that are laying low down by the bottom, which absolutely can be the case, when you turn that aeration system on, it's going to push that stuff from the bottom to the top and let it start to do what it does when it touches the, the sky and the atmosphere. Absorbing gases, releasing gases. So yes, you sure can have a pea soup green colored pond right now. Now, one thing to do, and a lot of guys think they know this, but prove it. Check your visibility. I was talking to a guy last week. He said, my visibility is six inches. I said, are you near the pond? He said, yes, I am. I said, is there a fishing pole anywhere? He said, yes, there is. I said, is there a lure on it? Yes, there is. Walk out there and drop it down and actually measure the visibility depth. And when, he, when, he, when we were talking, he said, my visibility is about six inches. And I had him measure it. It was 24. So it's real important to measure your visibility. Know what it is? Buy a Sechi disc. They're not that expensive. S-E-C-C-H-I, Sechi disc. And then actually measure your visibility so you'll know how, how, what your visibility is to see the density of that plankton bloom. And it's a good idea to measure it in the morning and again in the afternoon. Some plankton, especially the majority of which is algae or blue-green algae, tend to migrate toward the top So as the sun comes up. So the longer you go into the day, the more dense that bloom gets. And it, if, it's, if it gets to be six inches in the afternoon and it's 18 inches in the morning, you probably are leaning more toward blue-green algae and you want to do something about that. Now, another thing in York Springs, Pennsylvania, check your temperature. As long as your temperature is not above about 71 or 72, then I think you're probably going to be fine because that, that, that plankton bloom is going to shift. It'll go from that green pea soup rich look. It'll begin to shift as it matures. And what happens is as that phytoplankton grows, as long as it's not dominated by blue-green algae, uh, zooplankton will start feeding on it. It'll start eating it. And as it eats it, the color begins to change. The color will shift from that split pea soup green color to more of an olive color. So be checking that color difference. As it, as it shifts to an olive color, it's going to shift from that to more of an olive brown to a brownish olive. And then odds are it's going to begin to clear up after that. That is... That is animal plankton, plankton feeding on the plant plankton. And that's the normal course of events if you don't have blue-green algae. So checking your visibility and then watching the clarity of your water, the visibility of your water shift, that's going to help you decide what to do about it. Let's see here. I see Tim Jackson with Purina Mills checking in. Todd Austin is back on. Harrison Davis, according to Solitude Lake Management of Southern Speckle Belly Sunfish, is a hybrid sunfish between bluegill red ear, where about 95 to 100% are male. There you go. There's your answer right there. Thanks for looking that up. And so the only reason to have those is if you have a pond where you're wanting to minimize reproduction of sunfish with the odds of growing a big one. And the only unknown I have about it now that you guys have educated me is will they eat fish food? And I bet they will. Or Bobby Glennon. Wouldn't be messing with them. Clay Brown, 50 channel cat. Okay. Let's see here. Jay Spires got more order pretty quick that I placed a week or so ago. Faster than I thought. I guess you're talking about fish food. Kevin Briggs, Texas Hunter fish feeders are the best. Tim Stewart, hey, I just want to say that I got a bloom going in my pond. See, he's been wanting to have a bloom. So uh, here he goes. Let's see here. Tim Jackson, howdy. Mark Dyer, will bullhead stir up a pond and make the water dirty like carp do? Absolutely, yes, they will. Uh, Chad Bowman, who watches this show very often and is a, a big proponent of uh, and, a, and a member of the Palm Boss Discussion Forum, which is a great forum, by the way. If you want some answers quicker than I'm going to give them to you on a Wednesday evening, go to palmboss.com, click on Ask the Boss, and join in. It's free. We're not going to solicit you. I might hit you up once every five or six years to subscribe to the magazine if you don't. Uh, and you can post questions and get answers really fast from seasoned, experienced guys just like you and some of the pros that are out there that spend time on that forum. 
then uh, where I was going with this is Chad Bowman messaged me the other day. He says, I'm thinking about buying some alum to clear up my muddy pond. And he, it's, oh, I can't remember, it's like three acres now. And he's got quite a bit of shallow water, which he didn't intend to have, but he ended up with. And the bullheads are really thick. It's perfect. It's a perfect uh, pond habitat for bullheads. And so he's got a bunch of them. And he had trapped over a thousand of them, small ones, and getting quite a few big ones, you know, females full of eggs this time of year, about the time that they're spawning. So his question to me was, can I buy some alum, clear up the pond, so that the bullheads are easier to see, they can see better, and I can get more in my trap? Well, while that's logical, it's not real, because what the alum does is, is it causes the microscopic particles of clay to flocculate. And that's not a nasty word, boys. Quit laughing. It's because they're going to flock and fall out to the bottom. But when you got bullheads rooting around in the mud, they're going to start right back up. So it's not relevant. It's not, it won't work. You know, so the answer is, will bullheads stir up a pond and make the water dirty like, to absolutely they will. Now, that's especially if their numbers are high. You know, one thing Chad told me is he pulled out a jar of that water, set it on a shelf, and looked at it two days later, and it was gin clear with a layer of mud laying in the bottom of the jar. That tells me that the fish are stirring that water up. So what I'm going to tell you is get a one-gallon pickle jar, fill it up with pond water, and see if it settles out. If it settles out and you've got a layer of mud laying in the bottom of that jar and you can see through that water, it's fish or something wind action, fish action, cattle wading, whatever, that's keeping the mud stirred up and keeping that pond turbid. All right, let's see here. Zach Bollinger, Bollinger says, looks like I may have good soil for a pond and a house. Got to do more investigation. You know what? That's absolutely right. Do more due diligence. The more due diligence you do, the better result you're going to get. And I firmly believe in the concept of caveat emptor. You cannot totally rely on any single person to give you all your answers. So it's up to you to do your due diligence and be confident of the people that you choose to do whatever it is you're going to do, whether it's an insurance agent or it's an earth mover or a pond guy. You know, so you do your homework and you're going to get a lot better result, which means you need to really understand how soils work, what kind of soils you need to build a dam, you can get some of that from the NRCS. You can get some of that from the local earth movers. You can get some of that from independent consultants like Mike Otto. You can get some of that from guys like me. So if you talk to enough people and you gain confidence in, 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 your, in your person, then you're going to be more likely to, to get where you want to go. Bear Brundrett, have a bit of a problem with predator birds. They tend to congregate near the feeder when it activates. Per your advice, I've begun to feed Aquamax Sportfish MVP at 8.30 p.m. and 5.30 a.m. You know what? That's exactly right, Bear. If you've got great blue herons that are just chowing down on your fish as the feeder goes off, I'll never forget, I was uh, in Carrollton, Georgia one time with my good friend Johnny Tanner that owns CM Tanner Grocery Suppliers over there. And they he had just got through renovating a, a lake, probably a 15-acre lake, four or five years ago. Big, long pier going out from his cabin. Feeder set out there. He says, now watch. And he pointed way over there and he said, look, see up in that tree, there's a great blue heron sitting in the tree. He said, when this feeder goes off, the, the bluegills are going to come and boil all over the feed. And that great blue heron is going to fly down, land like an osprey, peck a bluegill, and flap his wings a couple times, come right back out of the water, go right back to that tree and eat that sunfish. And I would have bet a $100 bill against that, but I'll be dead gum if that's exactly what happened. I'd never seen it before. I've never seen it since. So I said, Johnny, you know how to fix that? And he says, no. I said, change the timer. <laughs> trick that fish or trick that bird. So that's what Bear did. He switched it to where the feeders go off at dark and at daylight. And that's going to make a difference. That's going to change up the habits of those predatory birds because at 8.30, they're headed for the roost. Good to see Sean Cole. Sean checking in from Lincoln, Nebraska. Kevin Briggs on one of my new ponds has a pH in the 9 to 10 area. Anything you do to lower it, figure out why it's that high. You got to know why it's that high. Um, and Kevin, in your part of the country, you can probably buy longleaf pine needles as mulch. 
Um, it's, it's not common that I advise people to put anything acidic in their water, but figure out why the pH is that high. See if it's hardness, if it's alkalinity, and it sounds to me like it's probably well water. If that's well water, you may want to shift the amount of well water coming into the pond to how much rainfall you're getting from clouds. So if you don't, if it's not well water, then there's something going on with the soils there to cause that pH to be that high. But I would want to know what kind of mineral influence it, does it have? You know, what kind of uh, negative ions such as carbonates, uh, you know, the different hardness, sulfur, what's that go going on in there? Check that out and then decide what you want to do about it. Let's see here. Harrison Davis, the May June issue is awesome. Hey, thanks, man. Wait till you see the July August issue. It's gonna be fun too. David Scheidegger checking in. Tom Blasdell got my new magazine today in the mail. We're having trouble keeping any catfish due to river otters. Would hybrid striped bass be as prone to otter predation? They're not as prone as catfish. Because now that doesn't mean that they're not susceptible. It just means they're not as prone. Um to otter predation whereby we could use them as an apex predator to keep the bluegill from overpopulating and stunting? That's a good question, so I'm going to answer it this way. Um, what happens in the wintertime when otters seem to be more prolifically feeding on our fish? In the wintertime, what channel catfish will do especially is they'll congregate in a big school in the deepest water that they can get in where there's plenty of oxygen and it's the warmest area of the pond, and it's probably right on the bottom. And they'll congregate in a big school, and they'll just lay there. Now, they don't generate any body heat, but it, it minimizes their heat loss. And they tend to just lay there and not move, So un unless they get spooked. So an otter can go down into that school, snag one, and the school will scatter, then the otter will go to the shore and do what otters do, chew the guts out, get full, leave the rest of it, and then go somewhere else. But soon that school comes right back together. And it's susceptible to being preyed upon again. Where hybrid striped bass, in cool weather, they're pretty active. They're more active in, in, in cool water than they are in hot water. So the odds of them getting caught and eaten by otters is a lot less likely than catfish. Uh, my follow-up answer is start trapping some otters. You know, with the losses that you can incur, it's worth it to pay a trapper, even if you pay them, you know, 50 to 100 bucks a piece to trap otters. And if they can sell the hides or sell the, sell the animal for a mount or something like that to taxidermist, I don't know how that works. I don't play that game, but uh, I'd sure look at that as well. Kurt McGlamory says, are common carp bad for small bluegill bass ponds of about five acres? They're only bad if they overpopulate. You know, common carp are highly reproductive. I mean, a female carp can have between half a million and three quarters of a million eggs. So if she can lay those eggs and successfully recruit into that pond, they can quickly become the dominant species just simply because they get so big and they reproduce so well, even if it's just one time a year. So as long as there's enough bluegills and bass in the pond to eat their young of the year and it's not prime carp habitat, then it's not bad to have common carp. However, I'd still take them out. I'd fish for them, use doe bait, get them to eat the fish food, shoot them, you know, with a bow and arrow and eliminate them if you can. If they're not a problem, that means there's not many of them. But if they are a problem, that means there's more than you want. All right, Kevin Briggs, thanks, you're the best. You're welcome. Harrison Davis, make sure that's the correct level. Uh, I guess I missed that, the, the best level. Like He must be talking to somebody besides me on that. Mm -hmm. Mark Dyer in a three to four acre pond. How many flathead catfish could be added to help reduce the bullhead numbers, but not have catfish take over the pond? Or is there a better solution to getting rid of the bullheads besides a full start over? Hello, Chris Chavetta. Late to class, but always enjoy. Yeah, good to see you, buddy. Hey, your story is going to show up in Pond Boss. It's looking pretty good, man. Chris Stillman, I see Chris. Okay, Harrison Davis talking about pH level. 
Yep. Uh, Harrison's saying to verify to verify your pH. I'd send a water sample in, going back to uh, Kevin, send a water sample in to a lab and have it checked not only for pH, but what can be influencing the pH. Okay, so Mark Dyer. Here's the, here's the way I look at flathead catfish. I look at flathead catfish as your trading problems. I mean, it's an old wives tale. I've heard it since before I started in the fisheries business. I had somebody tell me that when I was 10 years old. Put a few flatheads in there and they'll eat the bullheads. Yes, they will. They absolutely will. Uh, bullheads, believe it or not, they're predator fish as well. Even though they keep the mud stirred up. I mean, I've actually shocked up a 12-inch bullhead with a 5-inch gizzard shed hanging out of its throat. You know, so bullheads are predators as, as well. But here's the problem. Flatheads are active predators, but they also are territorial. So they're dominating their areas and they're protecting their areas. Anything that comes where they are, they're going to kill it, whether they eat it or not. So, you know, even in a, in a, in a three to four acre pond, even if you had four flathead catfish in there, they will become the dominant fish because once they hit about 20, 25 pounds, they're going to be eating your channel catfish, eating your bass, eating your big bluegill because they're not selective. They're just predatory. They're Actually, they become the apex predator of every pond when you put a flathead catfish in that pond. And I have seen ponds ruined by flathead catfish. There's one pond in particular not too far from Kerrville, Texas, where the problem is they stocked a few flatheads in there to do exactly that, eat the bullheads. But what happened was there was enough area and the conditions were perfect for them to reproduce. And the, the few times that I electrofished that dead gum pond, I shocked up everything from six inch flatheads to 35 pound flatheads. And the bass numbers were low, bluegill numbers were low, all the other fish except hybrid striped bass were low. And it's due directly to that predation from flatheads. But let's stay with the theory for a minute. Let's say that they would go clean out the, the uh, bullheads. How long does it take? It's going to take several years. It's going to take almost as much time for the flatheads to eat the bullheads as if you had some three to four pound bass and they're eating the bullheads. So flatheads, it's going to take a while to unpickle the pickle. And then you're going to be starting over anyway. So if the bullheads are so dense that you're thinking about flatheads, I would sure think about resetting the pond. And that's probably what Chad Bowman ought to do, is re start the pond over. You kill all the fish, start over. If the bullheads are the problem, kill them, start over. The best time to do that is going to be, well, anytime you can apply rotenone, which that can be anywhere, that can be all, pretty much all year round. So I could be thinking about doing it now. I would be looking at a start over if the bullheads are the problem. Let's see here. Let me go on down here. There's John Wilson. Man, what are you doing without baseball? Holy cow. Weird year. There's Justin Shank checking in. He got him some ponds out there on the left coast. Okay, so it looks like we're about to run out of questions. And now, since it's about 723, I can go back to the topic. <laughs> what can you do to make your small pond better for fishing? One thing you can do is verify your fishery which means you need to sample it. It's okay if, if you want to hire a professional to come out. Matter of fact, sometimes I think it's a smart thing to do to hire a professional, bring an electric fishing boat out, even if it's just a two acre pond and verify your fishery. Just make sure that you have what you think you have because in today's world, you can be decimated by otters in two weeks over the winter in a small body of water. You can be decimated in five days by a flock of cormorants. So if your fishing is not good, the first thing you need to do is verify your fishery. See if you've got the fish you think you do. And if you do, then you got to figure out how to make them bite. So one thing you can do there is start to feed the fish. If you'll feed the fish, that changes their behavior. And the fish that will eat fish food will come to that fish food. Another thing you can do is you can congregate your fish, which goes to habitat. As long as you've got good, clean water, your water's happy, and you've got some habitat, then you're gonna be able to grow fish. But you might need some congregational type habitat, meaning, uh, i tell you where, there are two things that congregate fish in a small pond better than anything I've ever seen, and that is rock piles and beaver lodges. And if you think about a beaver lodge, that is just a bunch of small sticks stuffed together. So brush piles and rock piles are the best fish attractors you can ever get in a pond. So if you don't have anything that attracts the fish 
and you do have a healthy population of fish, that means that they're probably dispersed. If you can congregate them, you're going to increase your odds of catching them. If you feed them, you're going to increase the pond's ability to produce more fish, and you're going to alter their behavior. You're going to force them out of their complacency to be trained to do what it is you want them to do, and that's move. The third thing is, if you fished your pond heavily and the fish have become hook shy, think about adding some more fish, the predator fish, of similar size classes of what you've got. If you bring in a few fish, that can change the behavior of the rest of the fish. I've done that many, many times, in, especially in lakes with a lot of fishing pressure. Well, we'll bring in some northern largemouth bass, for example, that are on fish food. We'll stock them in there at five to the acre, make sure they're eating fish food, and that completely changes the way that lake fishes. And that doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Let's see here, uh, Danny Mac says, dang, I hooked into a 25 pound, somebody hooked into a 25 pound flathead. How fast do channel cat fish reproduce? I have a half acre pond stocked, 50 of them, three years ago. Once channel cat fish hit about two and a half pounds, then they're big enough to reproduce, they're cavity spawners. So if they don't have a place to go in and hide, they're not gonna spawn. Now here's the catch 22. Channel catfish are so cheap that if you want more, buy more because you can buy the numbers you want. If you stocked 50 of them three years ago, go buy 50 more now and put them in there and buy them six to eight inches long. That way you can control recruitment. If a two and a half pound channel catfish female lays eggs and the survival rate's decent, like 10%, which means 90% of them get eaten, you're gonna end up with 2,500 more channel catfish in that half acre pond. That's too many. So don't encourage their reproduction. Just go spend 40 or 50 bucks for another 50 of them and restock those. It's a lot smarter way to do that. Let's see here. Um, that was Mike Cottrell that asked that. Chance Birch, does Chinese tallow tree leaves put off any kind of toxic toxin that will affect fish and frog spawning? I was once told that it was a study done on it that it shows that it affects them. I do not know the answer, but I know this. Walnuts, the walnuts in the husk are a fish toxicant. So when you got the green husks on walnuts, people used to use those in ancient times to, to drag through puddles of water to kill fish so they can eat them. I've never studied Chinese tall ch tallow trees, but I'm gonna tell you this. It would probably take a lot of any kind of leaves in a pond to create the density of a toxin to really cause a problem. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I don't know that, I'm only gonna guess. Let's see here, Justin Shank, did you know you can buy a channel catfish off eBay? Interesting, I thought, well, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, you can buy almost anything off of eBay. The problem is, is you gotta be sure it's legal to ship them to California, you know? And so there's gotta be somebody in California that sells channel cat if anybody wants them. So, that young phone's ringing. Beats me. Somebody from the 979 area code. We'll let Robin get it. She's still here working on the book. Okay, guys, we're knocking on the door at 730, so I could probably take one more question. And uh, while I'm waiting on that, I'm going to wrap it up at 730 and, and head out. Looks like I get to go down to my son's place. They had a tornado blow over his place today and knocked down about 50 trees and shredded a bunch. So we're going to go be cutting firewood for the next few days, looks like. So I'm going to wrap up with this. You know, while, while you guys, you know, we've been sheltering in place a lot less lately than we have been. One thing I've noticed over the last eight weeks of the coronavirus stuff is people are really centered back on how to be better stewards. I've gotten more phone calls from and emails and texts from people in the last few weeks about what they can do to take better care of their ponds. And I'm really, really thrilled that you guys are taking time to watch this. So I wanna challenge you to, to what you're learning from this show and all the other sites that you look at, pay that forward. You know, share that with people, share it with your neighbors. If you've got a pond, your neighbor does too. Share that with them and uh, let them know what it is that they're doing and that, that they have resources. Let them know that there's all kinds of Facebook groups. As a matter of fact, somebody started a Palm Boss Facebook group today and then told me about it. Well, um, 
Jason Nebstad and I were planning on getting that done. So we're going to do that and start a Facebook page. I don't want it to detract from the Ask the Boss forum, but I'm probably overdue for doing that with this Facebook page. And I want to appreciate you guys. I tell you, I appreciate you watching this show. And when you've got questions, be sure and holler. And until then, I'm going to cut out and wish you guys farewell and see you next Wednesday, probably from right here. So until then, adios. Go be good stewards. See you guys.